Uh, we're going to be exploring SDK add-ons for Android devices. My name is Larry Schieffer. Uh, there's my Twitter handle there. If you want to follow me. Uh, so real quick, I'll tell you a little bit about me and why I'm up here. So I'm CTO and co-founder of HiQs LLC. We're an uh, engineering consulting firm specializing in uh, Android mobile devices as well as uh, device driver sports sport packages uh, and really the complete software stack. I've got over 16 years uh, developing embedded and mobile device software of various kinds. Uh, so I've got extensive experience throughout the software stack and Android is a big case there. Uh, I've been from the bottom down to the bootloader all the way up to doing end application work and in addition to Android I've also worked on numerous other operating systems. I've been working with Android since the first uh, public release, since AO AOSP was put out. And I've actually been doing native development and debugging uh, since before the NDK was out. So I've got a lot of experience uh, working on the Android platform in all aspects of it. I've also been the lead architect and developer on three different custom Android platforms that were put out for OEMs. And I'm also an experienced trainer. So I've been up here and I've spoken at AndevCon before. Uh, I've also created some content for Pluralsight. They're an online uh, training uh, course provider. And I've also do in-person training on Android internals for the new circle. So let's go over a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we're going to talk about a little bit of OEM magic on a, on a platform and the SDK add-on. We're going to talk about what SDK add-ons can do, what they're capable of doing. And we're also going to talk about uh, app developers and how they can take advantage of the things that you're putting into your end platform. How many in the room are app developers only and not platform developers? All right, so good number. So the rest of you guys are all working on end platforms, building new devices. Uh, so this is good. Uh, we've got a nice fair mix in here. So then we're going to look at it from a platform standpoint. If you're creating a new platform, uh, how do you build one of these things? How do you create something that adds value to your platform? And how do you make that available uh, to your app developers? And then uh, we'll also talk a little bit about extra add-ons and what those are. They're a little different from the platform add-ons. We'll have a little Q&A, uh, but honestly, feel free. If uh, you guys have questions as I'm going through something, something's not clear, if I'm moving too fast, just uh, you know, let me know. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the OEM magic, the SDK add-on. All right, This is platform-specific functionality that you, the device vendor, want to be able to enable and give access to your users, something that's outside of the normal scope of what Android can provide. Okay? So you want to be able to give developers the ability to take advantage of those things and these value-added features that really exercise some neat things on your platform. So you're really extending the core Android feature set. You're providing functionality that's not there. And we've seen this in the market quite a bit. Um, a lot of times these things are adopted by the Android open source project. A great example is HTC. So HTC provided some of the original uh, Bluetooth low energy <coughs> work as well as uh, some of the original uh, HDMI output work and they work closely with Google on that and ultimately those kinds of features and functionality get pulled into the mainline Android. Basically what an OEM add-on or an SDK add-on is the special shared library which is on the OEM device and you can take advantage of those if you know how to use them. You give your users the ability to integrate those with ADT or with Android Studio so now app developers can develop against your SDK add-on and leverage the functionality that you provide. If any of you have worked on a platform before you're probably going whoa 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 hold on just a second here all right I thought OEMs can't play with Android that well, or not that well. They can't really mess with Android, okay? There are restrictions about what you can and can't do. The whole point of this thing is to make it universal, right? So I write my app in one way, and it works on all these devices. We know that's not always the case, but yes, according to the CDD, you're not allowed to do that as an OEM and as a platform vendor, but this is a little different, okay? For those who aren't familiar, the Android CDD is the compatibility definition document. Okay? This is a document that says if you're going to be called an Android device, this is what you have to do. Okay? These are the rules you have to follow in order to use the Android name. Okay? 
It has hardware and software requirements. And the thing is, it's based on the version of Android in use. So the requirements for the older Android 2.3 releases, the old gingerbread releases, are different than what they are for the latest KitKat release. So the spec continues to evolve. And based on how you want your device put into the market and what version you want to put in the market, you have to uh, adhere to those requirements. Okay? And it continues to move. A great example of this, you know, back in the Froyo and gingerbread days, they hadn't really got to tablets yet. So they had restrictions on you had to provide wireless telephony functionality on all Android devices. Obviously, that's pretty relaxed now because my Nexus 7, it's got Wi-Fi only. Okay? So it continues to evolve. You're no longer required to have some functionality, uh, but you are required to have other bits of functionality. Okay, what we're talking about is a little bit different. I'm not going to read that, and it's probably an eye chart for those of you back in the back. Okay? But section 3.6 of the CDD prohibits altering the public APIs. And if you read all that gibberish, it's going to tell you all the Java, Java X, Sun, Android, and com.android namespace have to remain intact. So you, as the platform vendor, are not allowed to touch those APIs. You can't alter them and change their signature. You can't add new methods. You can't add new classes. And you can't remove any classes or methods. They all have to remain intact. Now, there is a little caveat way down at the bottom, for those of you with really good eyes who can see it, that states you can't alter the signature of the various methods and classes, but you can change the implementation. Be careful, though, if you do that, because you have to adhere to whatever the contract of that class is or of that method. So if you're going to change the built-in behavior, make sure you're doing it in a way that's still going to maintain its compatibility. Okay? What we're doing with SDK add-ons is we're doing this in the OEM namespace. So you're calling your add-on something that's specific to your device, and you don't add it to what's considered the Android public API. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. So what can you do? You can do just about anything you want with one of these things. It's a good and a bad thing, right? So a good example, you've got Google's APIs. Okay, You've got the Map APIs. You've got the Play Store APIs that are all available as add-ons, but they're really integrated in with the OEM platform. Okay? The HTC Sense UI or the Echo Display or the HDMI output is another good example. Okay? These are SDK add-ons that are bundled with those specific platforms that you as an app writer can take advantage of if you know how to do it. But the OEM bears extra responsibility when you create one of these things. Okay? There are security risks associated with it. Are you writing secure code? This is going into every one of these million devices you're going to sell. You better make sure you get it right. Okay? Uh, you could have unintended platform side effects. So that gets back to if you're going to change the underlying implementation, you don't change the signature of a method, but it better behave the same way that the uh, stock code does. Okay, and you better have a good reason for why you're changing it. You could also have unintended app side effects. So you have to be really careful. From an app development perspective, where do you find these things? How do I take advantage of some of these things I've just named off? And it really depends on the OEM. Okay? Each OEM provides a different uh, location to where you can download SDK add-ons. They usually provide it via a URL that you can drop into the SDK manager and take a look at what they've got out there and pull it into your toolchain. They're not always easy to find. Sometimes they're buried. Okay? They don't make it obvious on how to find these things. And they're not always straightforward to set up. Ideally, you should be able to enter one of these URLs into the SDK manager and just click on a couple of buttons and boom, it's there. Okay? However, it doesn't always work that way. So, you just have to be aware of that as you're going through it. Okay? And not all SDK add-ons are created equal. In some cases, they provide emulators with the APIs that are going to emulate their devices. And they'll also provide the API that you can link against. In other cases, they're going to provide you with just an emulator. So you can see how your app would run on one of their devices, but they're not really giving you access to their underlying APIs. So like I said, they're not all created equal. 
So let's talk about how you might set one of these things up, and we'll use HTC as an example. If you load the SDK manager and you go to Tools, Manage Add-on Sites up in your menu, and you go to User Defined Sites, it's an extra button or an extra tab up there. And if you've got the URL, it's going to pop open this little dialog and you can stick the URL for uh, whoever's add-on you're looking for at the time and put it in there and hit OK. Sorry, didn't mean to advance there. And once you do that, it's going to basically add it to the uh, repositories and the sites that you can look through. Okay? So sometimes that's kind of hard. By default, the SDK manager sorts by name way down here at the bottom. And the easiest way to find a new repository or a new set of tools that you want to add is to go down and click that you want to sort by repository. And now, looking in my list, you can see all the way down at the bottom here that I'm looking at just the HTC add-ons and I want to check those and enable them and now I'll add them in. And it'll pull it down uh, and it'll install it to my local environment. Okay, but where is this thing? What happened once I did that? The SDK manager places it in the SDK directory on your hard disk or on your hard disk, on your disk and it's stored hierarchically under the add-on subdirectory. So if you look at an example here, you can see under my tools, uh, I've got the SDK and there's an add-ons directory. And in my case, we're looking at the HTC APIs and you can see how it's structured, okay, by their package. And I'm sorry for those in the back that that might be a little tough to read. I see a few people squinting. Does anybody have any questions on how you drop one of those into your environment? Yes. Uh, have you tried this in Android Studio? Yes, it will generally work in Android Studio the same because you can still get to the same SDK manager. Okay. All right, so on a, the platform side of things, you're integrating this functionality into your platform build. Okay, you're going to devi define this in your device or your vendor tree. How many people have built the AOSP source code? Anybody? Daring souls, good, I like it. So when you define your own uh, device or vendor tree, you're basically telling the build system in AOSP how you want to construct this thing, what packages are going to be there, and you're going to drop extra functionality in. Okay? You want to be careful in the core framework. Okay? You generally want to tread very lightly in there because you don't want to violate CDD and you also don't want to destabilize the system. Uh, later on, we're going to go through a little demo, and I'll show you how you can do it and still be CDD compliant, and at the same time, how easy it is to have unintended consequences. Okay, you're going to potentially open up something you shouldn't necessarily open up, and I'm doing that on purpose. Okay, these can include J and I components, although I'm not going to go over that. Okay, uh, your source tree is going to contain some make files. There's going to be a permissions declaration for your library, for your SDK add-on, and then you're going to describe with some details what's in your add-on, and then have the sources themselves. And all that's going to be under your device and vendor tree. Okay, so we're talking about basing our source code off of the AOSP public source. If you're working with a platform that's from a specific chipset vendor, for example, a Qualcomm or an Intel, they'll have a different variant, but even they derive all of their work from the AOSP source code. So it's all going to look very similar. Setting this up is beyond the scope of this class. Okay, this is, there's a lot involved there with understanding the underpinnings of the system, and uh, there's some, some good uh, training materials out there and available. Um, so I'm not going to cover all of that. We're going to briefly touch on some of these things as we go through just the add-on piece of it. Okay, you're going to want to get familiar with the build system. For those that are used to Eclipse and building applications with Eclipse or Android Studio, you can throw that out the window. Okay, this is all command line based. It's all make file based. It's extremely extensible in what it can do, but there's very little to no documentation on it. Okay, your documentation is basically the make files and they're not always commented. <laughs> All right. 
So if I'm creating an SDK add-on, I need to define some special make variables in my make file. Okay, we're going to define a product SDK name, and this is going to be what I call my name or my, or my module or my library. Okay, I define a special SDK add-on copy files. Now these are the files that I'm going to copy into my SDK add-on package that gets downloaded by people and pulled into their SDK uh, manager environment. Okay, the SDK add-on copy modules, this is a mapping of the Java fully qualified name of the package to the device file system. Okay, so I'm going to create an SDK add-on package that's going to have your typical Java uh, namespace and the fully qualified name there. Well, the system's going to need to know where on the file system of the end device that's stored, and that's really what this defines, okay? And don't worry, I'm going to give an example of all this. You'll get to see these in an actual make file. The uh, SDK add-on stub definitions, this basically tells the build tools that these APIs out of my package and out of my library are what are considered public and people could actually use and build against. Okay? The SDK add-on doc modules, this allows you to include documentation with your SDK uh, add-on. It's important. Make sure you add documentation, otherwise people won't know how to use your things. And you're going to modify some of the standard make variables that are available in the, uh, the Android source tools. Okay? Product packages, you now need to add your SDK add-on library to the product packages list that are going to get built into your end uh, product, your end image. Product copy files is a list of special files that are going to get copied to the device file system that tell the end file system what to do. Okay? Any questions on the build? I kind of skipped through that, I'm sorry. All right. Add-on permissions. This is handled both on the device and the build machine. This uses special files to define uh, what APIs from your library are accessible and the library itself. Okay? On the device, it uses an XML permissions file. And this is basically a mapping that says that my library is available to people to, or for people to use. Okay? So it gives them permission to use that library. And this XML file is, is copied as part of that product copy files variable in your system make files. So here's some sample contents of what this thing looks like. It's pretty simple XML. You just declare permissions. And I call out the fully qualified name of my library and where it's stored on the end device. Okay, so you'll see that I'm putting this under system framework, which is a typical place that system libraries go on the end device. On the build machine, you also have to set up some add-on permissions. Okay? This declares all the APIs which are publicly exposed. Now, this is an important detail because you could, from a Java perspective, declare certain classes or methods to be public, but this restricts it so that only the things that you define in this file are what's exposed in the add-on. Okay? If you've ever worked within the AOSP source code, this is the same way that the build puts together the Android jar file that everybody links against, right? when you create your APK. And there's, you know, the public APIs that we talked about before, you know, section 3.6 of the CDD and what it defines, those public APIs that all come straight out of that source code. There's a big XML file that defines these are the public APIs, okay? And there's annotations in the AOSP source code that says this is hidden, this is hidden, this is hidden. And during that build, if you were to violate CDD, there's some checks in there. So if you go to build AOSP, and you've added a method or a variable and you didn't mark it as hidden, the build will fail. And it'll say, whoa, you violated this, okay? Doesn't quite go that far with SDK add-ons, but this does allow you to strict, uh, restrict what it is you publicly expose to people. Okay, this is what was specified in the product SDK add-on stub defs, and the format is pretty simple. Basically a plus, the package name, and then if you don't want to restrict anything, you can use a wildcard. Okay, it's an asterisk at the end. Uh, if you wanted to specify a specific uh, class, you certainly could. Okay, or set of classes. It could just be a multi-line file. Okay, in our example, it's a real simple API as you see here, or you'll see here in a little bit, and we're just going to go ahead and expose it all. 
Now, the other thing we're going to define is a little manifest that's going to basically give the SDK manager details about our add-on, okay? And this is what is specified as part of the add-on copy files. This is going to, it can include the hardware INI and special skins. So if you wanted to skin your emulator image, right, so that it had a, a look and feel like your end device and your end phone or tablet or whatever, you could. You could go through that and you could include that as part of your build. Okay. Now this manifest isn't an XML manifest. It's not like uh, the manifest you use when creating an APK. It's a little different. And it's going to have a few key aspects to it. You're first going to define the name of your add-on. You're going to define the vendor, which is you, and a brief description. You can restrict it by API level and give it revision, uh, you know, whatever you want to call the revision of your own library. Um, and then you define the fully qualified uh, Java space library name. Okay, and then you go a step further and you say, this library is also called this. Okay, this is what, this is the jar file that is the result uh, or the mapping of the jar to this specific library. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So what about the sources? We're going to structure this in the usual way for a platform build. Remember, we're not building an APK here. We're not building an application. We're building something that's going to go into an end platform. So this uses an android.mk file. And there's all kinds of special variables and includes that you do in, uh, in order to build these files. And so if you're building an add-on, you're going to clear out your variables in your make file. You're going to tell it to, uh, typically if you're building a, a Java side uh, library, you're going to tell it what to do. And it basically, this is a, a helper function in the make environment that will walk through all subdirectories and look for Java files to build. Okay. Um, we call this module optional. Okay. Because it's not one of the stock special libraries that's bundled in every AOSP platform, you have to define this thing as optional. And later on in the top level make file of our platform, we're going to declare that this module is one of our packages. If you remember, I, I mentioned that you've got to define product packages. This is the module name that we're going to add in there for product packages. And then we build this as a Java library. Okay. You also want to make sure you build the Java doc too. So again, always important to uh, comment your code and provide documentation right there in line. And so there's some special make rules that allow you to do that. Okay. Uh, you can tell it to walk through all of the Java and any generated HTML files that you want to include in that build. And you basically give it the library that you're going to use. Uh, you're going to tell it it's a library and you call a special uh, make include which will build the, the documentation for it. And that'll all get bundled as part of your SDK add-on. Any questions on that? Okay, so building it. It's part of your product definition. So there's a special make rule you have to use to build. Unlike building regular AOSP where you just can call make after you've run lunch or included the appropriate product definitions, you actually have to call this special rule. Okay, and this name here is whatever you've defined your platform name to be. Okay, and we'll, I'll give you a good example of this here in a little bit. This is going to depend on the system having been built before and the SDK having built before, and it, it should trigger a build, but you know, it doesn't always work out that way. So um, you may have to do a clean in between. It really just kind of depends. Okay, once it's done, under your top level source tree, there'll be an out directory, and uh, it's going to drop everything as a, a pre zipped SDK add on. Uh, file which is going to be located in this type of a path and this build platform is basically the name of your platform. Okay, it's going to contain a stub jar file. Remember those APIs that we said these are my public APIs. That's what goes into that kind of jar file. It allows APKs to link against your API and then it's resolved at load time on the end platform. It will also include some emulator images uh, and any kind of other build files that you said you wanted to copy as part of the product SDK. 
So now we've talked about how you build this thing. You've built your own image. You've built an SDK add-on as part of it. How do you make it available to people? You know, earlier I walked you through you know, pulling in an HTC add-on. Now I've got my own. How do I make that so that you guys can build it? Okay. The SDK manager can use either a, a web URL or a local file. And in either case, it's looking for a special XML file, which is going to describe the add-on and some of the details. And it follows a pretty simple schema. It defines the name, the vendor, just like our manifest INI that we defined inside of our actual product build, inside of our source build. Okay, So you'll see that we define a name, an API level, uh, vendor ID, which is a little different than the vendor name. Uh, it's generally best to use something that's uh, suitable for use on a file system. So you wouldn't want to use something that has a space in the name, for example. Okay. You can define all kinds of things in here. What revision it is, a description, uh, a URL to link to it that someone could get to, like our website, for example. Um, you can also define your license, which can then link down somewhere else to a special tag that says this is the license for this, and it could be an open source license, closed source license, whatever you're comfortable releasing. Um, where it gets interesting is right here in the middle. Okay, and unfortunately, uh, the default build system doesn't have an automated, automated, automatic way of generating this for you. Okay, so once you have that zip file, you have to come in here and write this XML and generate some of these things. So you can tell it uh, exactly uh, what the size of the SDK add-on is and then a SHA-1 hash for it that's used as a checksum. The exact name of the file, and this is relative to uh, this XML file on the end server. Okay. And then there's also a libs section which lists the fully qualified domain name of what's in there. Any questions over that? Okay. So some additional items. Again, I want to touch on security again. It's really easy to blow your own foot off with this thing. Okay, you can get in there and you could add all kinds of functionality, but if you're not careful, you could make it really dangerous. You're going to want to use custom permissions. Okay, if you're enabling access to special hardware on your device. You definitely want to make sure that users are aware when they install an APK that's going to leverage this functionality that they need a special permission. Okay? You want to enforce existing and new permissions. Okay? So even though you define a permission, it doesn't do any good if your end code on the platform itself doesn't actually pay attention to it and it doesn't check that a process that's calling into this thing actually has that permission. You want to be wary of data usage and persistence. I mean, these are just common security things, uh, but you're talking about working at the platform level here, so you definitely want to be careful. You want to be careful of any kind of side effects. Anything that you add must be really stable. Okay? Uh, a great example of how this can go awry, I had a, uh, an Android phone that was a gingerbread phone from a vendor that will remain nameless and it had a service that would run on it and about every other day it would just go absolutely nuts and it would consume 100 percent of the cpu and my battery would go from full to i'm turning you off in the span of about 30 minutes okay um, so you want to be careful you want to make sure what you're doing is stable and deals with error conditions like any type of system software Uh, only the name. I don't think they'll have any kind of description. Okay, but that's a good question. It's something that I've not actually had to look into for one of my customers. Okay, you want to make sure your code's efficient. Okay, so in addition to error handling, you don't want to do something that's going to chew up a ton of memory, right? And basically make it harder for apps to run on your end platform. Uh, you want to make sure you use proper threading and locking. Uh, you know, those typical things you need to be concerned about. All right, so let's do a, a quick demo and uh, we'll do a code walkthrough on, uh, basically I'm gonna add uh, the functionality to be able to read the process ID of system server. Does everybody know what system server is? Okay, so system server is basically the hub of all services in your Android platform, okay? 
Anytime you've, you call into one of the manager APIs and you say, I want to talk to the notification service, okay, and I want the notification manager, or I want to talk to the vibrator service or anything like that, it all goes through one central hub, okay, and that's called system server. So this is a pretty central piece of the Android system, and it runs with some pretty high level of permissions, okay. Anytime you access anything at the HAL layer, Hardware device access, so you know, vibrator access, audio access, anything like that, this is all going to funnel through this process. So knowing it's PID, eh, probably not the safest thing in the world, although you couldn't really kill it unless you, were, you, know, you had super user permissions yourself. Um, but I wanted to show you this because it, how easy it is to add something like this in that doesn't violate CDD. Okay? So it's easy to create an SDK add-on, but you want to be careful. So we'll start with the code first and then I'll walk through some of these build files, okay? Here in the context object within the framework code, so I'm, I'm doing this on a 4.3 AOSP tree, okay? So under frameworks base, core, Java, Android, content, you have the context object, okay? Everybody's used to passing context or ob uh, objects around everywhere. <laughs> And you'll see that I add a new service name so that I can request it from system server. Okay, and I can do a service lookup. Now you'll remember I can't alter this API. I can't add anything to it. So I've got an annotation here that tells the build system to hide this. Okay? So I'm going to know about it in my platform code, but no one else will. It's all going to be completely abstracted. So let's jump down to um, I apologize, one second, I'm in the wrong place. Jump into system server, and when system server starts up, it's an interesting read if you're ever uh, in the mood. You can see it's pretty lengthy too. This is what's starting all those various components that are running on your system, like I mentioned before. The package manager, you can see it right there. Um, the account manager, content manager, the light service, which controls all the LEDs, the vibrator, the battery, all these things are initialized at system startup, and this is a, a pretty first-class citizen in the system, okay? So what I've done here is, in my example, I'm starting up our new service, assuming I haven't passed it here. And this special object that it's going to create. Bear with me, I'm sorry. My editor decided to stop working on me. At any rate, it's gonna create an instance of this guy. So I know platform service because I just instantiated it is running as part of system server. So I define a very simple method which is going to just say give me my process ID. Okay? And then I define a get ser uh, system server process ID method. And you'll notice that I've extended a binder interface. Has anybody worked with binders? Good. So our binder is a special interface that allows cross-process communication. Okay? Any one of those services that we've been, you know, that I've named off here, the vibrator service, the notification manager, the package manager, the alarm manager, all those things, to talk to system server, Android uses uh, the binder interface. It's, it's very central to it. It allows you to define uh, methods and uh, special objects that you can pass across processes. And so I've defined a simple method that just returns an integer to uh, give me the system server process ID. And you'll see here, this is in AIDL. So part of the build tools will build this into a Java proxy class, basically. So there's a stub and there's a proxy. And I won't go into all the details there because it's way beyond the scope of this class. Um, but you can see here that this provi provides an implementation of that API, okay? The last little piece that we did here within Framework Space is in this big old make file, 
it defines all of the interfaces, all the binder interfaces that are bundled as part of the framework. And our new interface also gets thrown in here, and I lost my highlighting. But I had to add it to the make file. Okay? And you'll also notice that here in the AIDL, I've added an annotation that says this also should be hidden. So my new special interface class is also not going to be exposed to the public Android API. So I'm still in compliance with CDD. Okay? So all that's great. I've added something to the framework. I've added a new system service that sits out there and when asked what its process ID is, it'll report it. But how do you actually use that thing? Now you remember I mentioned that you're going to define a device in the device tree. And I have all the files loaded here. It's under a different tree um, rather than my AOSP source code. So let me pull it up there instead. So here under device, you'll notice I added a high queues directory and what I've called Ballard. I just decided to name my platform Ballard. And we'll open all these various files that are in here. Okay, the first one being vendor setup. This is just a, a script that when you include the environment setup script as part of your AOS, AOSP build shell, uh, this will get picked up automatically and it'll add something to the lunch menu. Okay, and it, if I'm speaking a completely foreign language right now, I apologize. It's pretty easy though. It's um, I'll do it real quick here. So if you uh, wrong directory. So if I include this environment setup, you'll see that it walks through all the various devices that are defined in my OSP source tree. And here's my Ballard device, okay, that we were just looking at some of that code. And if I run lunch, which is basically how you pick what it is you're going to build, you'll see that number 11 here is now my Ballard user debug definition, which corresponds to exactly what I had it here, okay? So when I pick number 11, it's basically going to chew through a bunch of stuff and it's going to set up the environment to build that end platform, okay? I've already got one built and I've got an emulator running with it we're going to get to here in just a second. But at the end of this, you'll see that it's flagged some build variant information. I'm building for an ARM v7a um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a release build here. Now, some of these other files we've already talked about. Here in my make file, you'll see that product packages. I said I'm going to need this library. That's going to get included in the end build. Here in copy files, I'm going to copy this end XML permissions file over to the end file system location on the device. So under system Etsy permissions. Define my SDK add-on name, the manifest INI and hardware INI that I want to define for my emulator. So these are all the things that you're going to set up like we already talked about in the slides. Okay? And I give it a name down here. My product name, the brand, and a little description of what the model is. Okay? And go through our manifest INI. This is going to look exactly like what you saw in the slides. Okay, so these are all the end files for my device so that when I build, it can build both the platform as well as the SDK add-on for my platform. Okay, so that's all great, but, you know, I keep talking about this library. Where is this magical beast? So here under my device tree, I've added my own what I call frameworks utility library. And here's my permissions file that got copied by the make file. And the make file itself, which I won't bother opening because it's just going to drill into all subdirectories to build Java code. And here you'll see the Java code that is the library an end application user is going to call. Okay? So as an app user, and we'll walk through an app that's going to use this here in a moment, it's going to get a an instance of a platform info object 
and then it's going to call get service. And get service, oh, I'm sorry, that's a private method. It's going to call get system server PID. Internally, that's going to get a special binder interface to our underlying service. And then through that binder interface that we defined, it's going to call get system server PID. This is going to cross that process boundary and it's going to go over to system server and call that method on system server and return me the result. Okay? Now you'll notice I also wrapped this in a try and catch. Okay? If this capability is not there, I'll get a remote exception. Okay? And I, I won't be able to do it. So here when I do get service and I try to do a get service from the service manager, if this thing fails on me, I will gracefully fail. Okay, so I can actually run this. I'm going to run it on an emulator and you'll see it'll report back the, the PID of system server. If I stick it on my Nexus or I stick it on my S3, it'll gracefully deal with it at the application level if I've done my app correctly. Any questions on the library so far? Okay, everybody's good. So we'll pop over to Eclipse and let's look at our code. It's pretty simple. I'm not going to win any awards with the prettiness of the app. It's pretty ugly. Okay, you'll see I have an activity, sets a simple content view, and basically gets it set up. And then once I'm started, creates an instance of the platform info object we just looked at, and then asks for the uh, system server PID. Okay, if it hits any kind of exception, it's going to throw up an error message and gracefully deal with the problem. Okay, um, let's run this real quick. And we're going to run it. I have an emulator running in the background that is from that AOSP build. So when Eclipse gets around to running it, and you'll see it reports back the system server PID is 283. So if I pop back over to my terminal, and I shell into the emulator, system server is going to pop up and the process ID is 283. So we know that we actually did communicate with that server and we did cross that process boundary and we're using our SDK add-on. Okay, so the only other difference here is in my application, sorry it's not in the manifest, it's in project properties, when I set it up I told it that my target was my Haikyuu's SDK add-on that I had added. So when I came, I, prior to the class, and I apologize, I probably should have done this as part of the class, Within the SDK manager, I added a URL for basically this add-on that I created that's hosted on our website. And let me sort by repository because it, again, will be easier to find. And here it is, my Haikyuu's platform utility SDK. So it's part of my add-on and therefore when I, um, when I created this Eclipse project, I could tell it exactly what the target was for the project. And so right here I could select that and it adds that to my project properties and it tells it exactly what to build against. Okay, You could, uh, for example, if you wanted to target multiple devices, as long as you write your app code to where if a library load fails or a jar file is not present, you could do that within your app. And rather than target like this, if you have access to their SDK jar files, you could just add those to your build path and still be able to use those end applications or those end features, I should say. All right, any questions? All right, we'll hop back over here. So one other thing I want to talk about is SDK add-ons, which are a little special and they're called extras, okay? These are third-party components that are not necessarily tied to a platform. Okay, a good example is the Android support library. Okay, anybody use the Android support library? All right, lots of people use that. Um, gives you access to features that are in the newer API levels 
but you can still use it on older platforms. So you can now write your application and deploy it on uh, an older platform, but still use some of the newer functionality. A lot of people use it for fragments, okay? Um, because it'll go all, way, way back. Those are all extras, okay? They're not, they don't have to be integrated with the platform. It's a special library you're going to link against, and you can make that available to end users to take advantage of. Google Play Services is kind of another one, okay? You can specify the architecture NOS if you actually need to as part of an extra that you're going to create. So what can an extra contain? Okay, remember this is a little different than a platform SDK add-on. Okay, you're typically going to include libraries. Okay, you might include some sources. Okay, you might give people sample source. You might give them other sources. Uh, you're basically going to tell it, I want to package all this stuff in here. Okay, uh, the Android support library is another good example of this. There's all kinds of sample code that gets bundled in there. So when you download and install that extra as part of the SDK manager, you have access to that. Documentation is a big one, right? Everybody loves their documentation. Big tip, use Javadoc, okay? Comment your code, do it right then and there. It does all the heavy lifting for you, okay? And when you, if you were to create an extra, if anybody's used any of the uh, third-party add-ons for crash analysis or ad networks and things like that, they're using these types of SDK add-ons, okay? This is one way that you could do this and make it available. Uh, samples, getting back to the code. So packaging is going to look very similar to the platform SDK because it's in that same kind of XML format. The big difference is here in uh, the XML for your extra, you're going to define it as an extra rather than as an add-on. Okay? You're also going to provide a SDK path tag which is going to tell the SDK manager where to install it on your local file system. Does that make sense to everybody? I'll give you a good example of that here in just a second because we're going to talk about where they're stored. It's still under the SDK tree, but on, instead of under the add-on directory, it's going to be under an extras directory, and it's hierarchical again by the vendor, and it uses that path tag from the XML to tell it where to stick it under the vendor tree. Okay? So way down here you can see I've got utilities under high queues because back here in my XML, oops, I have my path directive and I told it to stick it under utilities and it's going to put that under my vendor ID directory. So just like the, uh, the SDK add-on, where they're here and then it's hierarchical by vendor, it's the same thing under extras. So under extras, we've got a high queues directory and then utilities, and then whatever we decided to bundle as part of it. So now how do I use it? And the short answer is it's going to depend. Most of the time these things are libraries. They're static libraries that people can drop into their, uh, their, pack, their, uh, their Eclipse build system. So you might create a libs directory under your project and copy the jar file into the libs directory. Unfortunately, uh, there's not a way that you can have an extra that's just an Eclipse package that you can just pull into. And you could say, this is a library package, I want to link against it. Okay? A lot of times they can be demonstrated or they can be used in place. So the Google Web Driver or the Intel Haxam installer is a good example. Okay? Those are extras that you check the box in the SDK manager, it pulls it down, and now it's effectively downloaded an installer. And so if you go into that extras directory and find, let's say, the Haxam installer, you could execute that and it'll do whatever it needs to do for your, your host machine. Okay? Like I said, there's no built-in support for this just giving you an Eclipse Android library project that you could add to your workspace and then just point to it. Okay, any questions? We're a little bit on the early side. Yeah, if it can't find the library, then you'll have a load failure uh, the first time you try to use it. And is there any way to actually distribute these other than shipping like a custom 
The platform SDK add-ons? No, it has to be cooked into the end platform. Okay. The difference is, I mean, extras are a different thing, right? So um, I gave an example here of an extra, and there's actually all kinds of URLs here for reference. Um, the, I've got Git repository, or GitHub repositories out here if you guys want to look at samples um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. The presentation's available at this URL. Um, if, you pull, if you point your SDK manager at this URL, the couple of add-ons that I talked about in this talk are there. You could actually pull them down and look at them. One of them is an extra, okay? And it's a simple one. It's, it's put out there binary only. There's no source code or anything. Um, so as long as it's a standalone library, you absolutely can put that out there and anybody could grab it, okay? And anybody could use it. But if it's something that takes advantage of platform-specific features, value-added hardware components or anything like that, no, that functionality has to be cooked into the end platform for someone to take advantage of it, or rooted. <laughs> Any other questions? You can tell it's Friday. You can tell it's the last session of the day. All right, if everybody could leave feedback, I would appreciate it either via the app or grab a form and drop it off. And if nobody has any questions, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you for your time.